All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for making it to the very last breakout session of Open Infrastructure, Open Infrastructure Summit. So um, you guys are committed, that's awesome. <laughs> so um, my name is Patrick Easters. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, uh, and I'm here to talk to you guys about some CICD. So we have the pipe dream. So when you hear a CICD, you see you kind of have some continuous integration, which is where you just build and test repeatedly. And you have your continuous delivery, where you automatically just deploy to production once you have your code tested and everything passes. But if you work at an enterprise like I do, you often have a lot of other steps in there too, like code quality checks, security scanning and vulnerability scanning, change management, and portfolio management. It's like Kanban, Agile, um, any of those processes. So while it's fairly easy to find solutions for the top pieces, like build, test, and deploy, um, we often overlook the things at the bottom. So today we're just going to look at how my team at Red Hat was able to integrate these basically business pieces into our pipeline, just like we do our build and test processes. So let's meet the team. So we are 22 people uh, distributed across three states in the US and three continents. Um, so we have some managers, we have uh, developers, we have SREs, quality engineers, and business analysts um, just all working together uh, to basically help build and maintain applications uh, to help Red Hat customers manage their descriptions and access content. So where do we begin? So I joined Red Hat back in 2016, and we were pretty early into our um, DevOps store journey. Um, so we were pretty siloed. We had one like IT operations group that performed most of our releases. And for teams that did want to deploy their own applications themselves, you had to go through a stringent lieutenant process to be able to get production access. We had a pretty good use of config configuration management, um, but our puppet infrastructure, I mean, it was almost 15 years old at that point, and it had a lot of baggage with it. So our developers hated using it, and they were pretty much scared to touch anything in it. And we were pretty slow with the way we released software. We released maybe twice a month, and that's for like our flagship applications. So the terrible release process. So let's see how bad it was. So for any given release, um, basically getting a piece of code from being developed to production, we had to go through no less than seven people, two of which weren't even on our team. So let's follow this. So let's say a developer has some code complete and they're ready to start the process of getting it to production. So their first step is they talk to our quality engineers and our QA folks will um, go through and update any automated test suites that we have, um, basically remove tests, add tests, that kind of thing. Then after our quality engineers have gotten our testing suite updated for the new code, we talk to our business analysts to make sure that uh, the story actually matches um, what description was and that we meet all the acceptance criteria. So at that point, we're ready to start getting this towards production. So we start the change management process. We create a change request, we have our manager approve it, then it goes over to our change manager. So after the change manager sits on it for however long and we're ready to start the process, we hand it over to our friendly ops person. So this is a person who has like production access and just is able to SSH in and do our configuration management. So at this point, um, we're ready to merge in our public code to the appropriate environment and basically run a release playbook. Uh, we use Ansible for most of our orchestration. Um, so after this ops person gets code in QA, we talk to our quality engineers who log into Jenkins and kick off a test. And unfortunately, since our tests kind of flicker sometimes, we have to go through and triage those results manually every time. So at that point, once everything passes, we go to our stage environment. So we're back to our friendly ops person, so they do their configuration management magic and release it, and we're back to our quality engineer. So our engineer, quality engineer runs tests once again and likely finds some new test failures um, that we didn't find in QA, but we triage them and go on. So at this point, uh, we're ready to talk to our product owner. So our product owner is the one who um, basically just kind of shepherds 
all the changes we make to the customer portal. So they review the change, make sure that it's what they were expecting, and sometimes there are changes we have to coordinate with other teams inside um, the customer portal. So the product owner would take care of that and make sure that we have all our ducks in a row. So at that point, we go back to our ops person who does the same release process in prod, and assuming that passes, we go back to our business analyst who will then just do one final quick smoke test and um, then accept the story once it's fully completed and tested. So that's a lot of people. So if we put this into a process, um, this is kind of what it looks like. So all the gray boxes here are manual steps we had to do. Um, so even though we had like Jenkins and we had um, some configuration management, there's still, it still required human touch and human processes. So there are a lot of parts here. So we have testing, change management, uh, release packaging and tagging. Uh, we have portfolio and Kanban management. And we have like sign off steps for the business. So we have some oppor opportunities for improvement here. So releases were time consuming and only a handful of people had prod access to do them. Um, like I like the Google SRE definition of toil because it just perfectly describes what we had here. So it's just work. Tied to, directly tied to running a service that's just repetitive, manual, and time consuming. And because these releases just took so much effort, we didn't do them very often. So that led to a long cycle time. So a cycle time here is basically just the time it takes to get, a st get code from development to when it gets into production. And the process was confusing. As you saw, we had seven different people um, who have to stay on the same page for a release. And there were lots of different hands offs. So it's really easy to miss one of those and delay the process even further. So we wanted to make our lives better. Um, we tried a few things on our own, like seeing how we can um, use Jenkins to automate some of these pieces for us or um, change the way we use Ansible. But around the time we were really seriously trying to invest into our process, uh, Red Hat IT launched a new platform as a service offering that was available for application teams in Red Hat. So this is a new offering based on OpenShift 3, uh, which is basically Red Hat's um, new platform as a service based off, based off Kubernetes. So with this new platform, I mean, application teams were given access to their apps in production. So we could operate them, and we had basically the same control of our apps as the IT operations team did um, back in our old model. And we had um, a central Jenkins instance to kind of manage like the image builds and deployments. So we had a few like CI steps for free. So we put our apps on Kubernetes and everything's perfect, right? <laughs> Unfortunately not. So let's go back to our process chart and see where we started. So we have all these steps and everything's manual. Now that we're on paths, we had a few things automated, but nothing was really continuous. So it wasn't really CI CD, it was just ID. Um, this was even after we iterated on some of the standard offerings that came in this platform. So we created like one pipeline to rule them all. So we had one Jenkins pipeline that basically followed our code all the way from being merged into production. And we had just basically input steps to kind of mark where we had manual sign-offs or approvals or even just manual steps. So we still had a spot in our pipeline to be able to represent that. And we established a pattern of um, using a central CI instance to follow the release, but we also used um, like the Jenkins webhook plugin to be able to call out to other CI instances to run tests. Because um, we had we had written a Jenkins instance that worked pretty well, so we didn't want to have to give that up to use this platform. So it worked pretty good for one or two apps we migrated onto this PaaS platform, but frankly, everything we migrated was pretty low touch. So we didn't have nearly as many people working on these apps, and we didn't have nearly as much time invested in them as some of the others. So we decided to turn up the heat. So first, we migrated our flagship app. So access.reddit.com slash management. So it's what we call RHSM Web. It's basically the web UI to manage your subscriptions. And then we are also about to start a brand new Greenfield project called RHSM API, which is basically just an API counterpart to the front end app we have. So it didn't take long, really just a few weeks to find constraints in our process. 
So the first one was our dev environments. So previously in our VM deployments, we had one or two shared dev instances um, that had their own basically constructs and environments and configuration management. And so without really thinking, we just kind of migrated that same pattern and put it in the paths. But as we started having many developers working on these two apps at once, um, it's pretty clear that this um, kind of shared dev, shared dev model didn't work. Um, so we had many toes being stepped on. So developers were constantly trying to merge not really complete code into one branch. We had lots of merge conflicts. And when it came time to release, we had to cherry pick out certain commits into our release branch, which just wasn't really cutting it. So enter our short-lived uh, merge quest instances. So we use GitLab for our source control. Um, so it's pretty much like GitHub if you've ever used that. Um, and so, th so their equivalent of a GitHub pull request is a merge request. So that's what I'm talking about here. So basically on each commit um, to a merge request, uh, we started building a OpenShift deployment for the app. So every developer got their own sandbox that they could see their changes being updated with and they can share it with others too. So as soon as we get that um, new image built for a merge request, our friendly Jenkins bot uh, posts on a merge request and gives developer a link to their sandbox environment. And the joy of having it in that merge request is we're able to look at that merge request for the history and find, just have one central place to be able to view that. And that gave us like several benefits. So we were able to shift left a lot of our, um, a lot of our things like security scans, unit tests, test coverage checks. Um, a lot of this stuff wasn't happening until the very end of a developer working on a story. But being able to give them that early feedback early on um, just really kind of sped up the process and just didn't give them a huge gotcha at the end. And um, one of the things we didn't really anticipate was that um, it was really, benef really beneficial for our quality engineers and our business analysts. So by having these instances that are constantly being updated, um, they can kind of get a head start on writing automation tests, and our business analysts were able to kind of peek in early on and just give guidance. And our testing suite. So many, most of our apps were web-based um, and UI-driven, so we had a lot of UI automation tests, just using Selenium and just that kind of browser infrastructure. Um, so because those were browser-based, um, like, they were pretty brittle. So anytime there were like browser upgrades or say like the customer portal updated some JavaScript or CSS, um, it could have unintended consequences on our tests. And like for instance, we even found a situation where like if our Selenium infrastructure was down, Jenkins would just skip all of our tests and mark the build as green. So <laughs> yeah. So we had our false positives and our false negatives. So really, like, no one just trusted the tests. That's why we still had to have someone triage the test and just make sure that Jenkins isn't flat out lying to us. Um, so we had, to, we had to take a pretty concerted effort to fix this. Because um, we're never going to be able to automate our tests if we can't trust them. So instead of spending time writing new tests or um, like even just writing code for our apps, uh, we, took some time to make sure our tests were actually green. And we eventually got to the point where we were able to trust them again. And um, we actually removed one of those manual steps in our process of um, having manual validation between our QA and stage environments. So you're able to kind of remove that extra gate. And change management. Uh, so change management was easily like everyone's least favorite part of uh, software release. Not sure if any of you have like pretty strict change management boards or process, but I feel like everywhere, like your change management is just terrible. But um, I mean, so over the years at Red Hat IT, like our process wavered between various levels of just being fast and loose and just straight up draconian. But we finally reached a good middle ground um, after kind of working with our change management team. So the first thing we did was um, just figure out better risk, cat risk categorization. Um, not all changes are created equal. So previously, like a zero downtime rolling software release, like what we were doing, went through the same process that like a hardware change took, like a switch core update, or even just like racking stacking stuff in a data center. Um, so after we were kind of able to better categorize these uh, changes, like we were at a point where low, low risk releases 
no longer required change manager approval. So we took out one external party from that first, one of those first slides I just showed you. Um, we got rid of some arbitrary timing requirements. So despite the fact that like, we have business, business analysts on our team who are uh, constantly talking to uh, the business and talking to our product owner, um, once we open a change and we're ready to go to production, our change management required us to wait a week. Because if you just sit on code for five more days, it, it's just magically better, right? <laughs> so um, we worked with them, and basically, they decided to uh, let application teams handle the lead time themselves. I mean, we're all, I mean, we are Red Hat, so we are all on the same team, and we all share the same badge. Um, so basically, by letting application teams kind of handle lead time um, with the business, like it turned out to be way better because we were already communicating with them. And it, as long as we're keeping them informed, I mean, that's the point of lead time. Then we, had in a, we used to have end of quarter freezes. Um, so basically, every quarter for four weeks, basically two before and two after, uh, production was off limits. We couldn't deploy any code. So four weeks a quarter, that's basically a third of the year where prod was off limits. And then that also led to the glorious day right after change freeze where you have a month of changes that have been waiting to go to prod that go all at once. Um, yeah, great day to take PTO. But. Um, and then we also worked to get um, a new, new type of change called a standard change. So I think that's like an ITIL term. Uh, but basically, it's a low risk, low impact, uh, repeatable change um, that is pre-approved. So once we kind of demonstrated that our releases were low risk and successful, and we had documented procedure, uh, we could do those anytime. And that drastically reduced uh, just how long it took to get our change management ducks in a row. And API integration. So our Red Hat uses ServiceNow to uh, manage their changes internally. So uh, we worked with our ServiceNow team to just get API access and to uh, basically make that as part of our pipeline. So just like we have build and deploy steps, we have a change management step that'll open a record and then close it once we're done. And our Kanban board. Uh, so our team uses Kanban, which is kind of a variation of Agile, where we don't really have sprints, we just kind of ha constantly have iterations. But um, the way Kanban works is it ha has a lot of force limits of how much work can be in progress. So it's really important to have up-to-date con Kanban board. We want to make sure we're not breaking work in progress limits. And it also just became a place where like, managers and others on the team went to see where a story is in relation to production. But as we kind of started getting this pipeline where things were getting automated, it was easy to forget what part you have to do and what part a robot does for you. So uh, we very quickly just became to the point where we couldn't really trust the status of the board. So user stories weren't being moved when buttons were being pushed to deploy stuff to a different environment. And we spent lots of time just going back and forth like, hey, is this story in QA or is it in stage? Um, and management just couldn't quickly tell status anymore. And so it didn't give them a good idea of um, what, what we're doing. So the answer to this was kind of similar to uh, what we did with change management. So we hooked in with APIs. So now, um, basically, as soon as we have a successful deployment in QA or stage or prod, uh, we move our stories along the board with them. So remember last time we looked at this graph? So we had a few items that were red, but and then that were automated, but uh, most, of, most of our steps were still manual. So now it's looking a lot better. We have CI pretty much. Um, we have automated tests and deployment to our sandbox environment, and we have that nice short feedback loop that um, just allowed developers to constantly get feedback um, from both just automated tests and from others on our team like quality engineers and business analysts. And we're pretty close to CD. Um, we still have some manual steps for initial merge, and we have uh, two gates before prod, which is for our just quality sign off and our basically business sign off. And we're not quite mature enough to get rid of those gates yet. Um, we're getting there. Um, so one of the things we're looking into right now is just how we can use feature flags to make our releases just less risky. So even if code isn't fully like tested and isn't like like fully baked and hasn't like hasn't reached its final iteration. We can still release it to prod with just a feature flag off, but 
That's something we're still kind of exploring and seeing what we can use. So was it worth it? Um, let's put some metrics behind it. So before I start showing graphs, like just one disclaimer, uh, there are many factors that can affect metrics. Uh, it's not just CICD. Um, and I'll, I'll call out some of those things in the graphs, but um, yeah, just a disclaimer that causation does not mean correlation. Or other way around, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So measuring performance of software delivery is like tricky, but there's been some interesting research done in the past couple years around this. Um, so I stole this chart directly from the 2018 State of DevOps report. So um, this is done by like a research organization that basically sends out thousands of surveys to um, basically developers and other technical people at uh, basically software delivery teams. And they try to kind of look at results and then basically find trends and basically find a way to measure how organization performs. Um, so I have the link to this uh, report in my speaker notes. Um, so look for it afterwards. And if this kind of stuff interests you, like kind of learning how to um, basically measure your team's like delivery performance, uh, there's a really good book called Accelerate. That's by uh, Nicole Forsgren, uh, Jess Humble, and Gene Kim. Uh, so like Gene Kim's the guy who wrote like the Phoenix Project, which is a pretty common, pretty popular book from a couple years ago. But um, yeah, I highly recommend it. I'm about halfway through it now. But um, yeah, it has some really good like ways to just practically measure your team. Um, so where does my team stack up here now? Probably high. Um, like we deploy pretty frequently. Um, we're definitely not doing like like every hour or anything, but um, I mean within a day to a week. Our change length time is pretty low. We're less than a week at this point. Um, our mean time to recovery, which is basically how long it takes to recover from a failure, is very low, and we have very successful change rate. So. Um, we have this pr very good repeatable process that doesn't fail anymore now that we've taken a lot of these human elements out. And as much as we have like continuous integration and delivery, we have continuous improvement too. So like our team's been working to fine tune our process and like we're never really done yet. Um, so hopefully eventually, like maybe this time next year, we'll, we'll be in that elite category. And it's really not just us that are kind of having to face this whole idea of continuous improvement too. Um, so the State of DevOps report has been going on since about 2014, I believe. And it was just 2018 that they added this new elite category. Um, so basically, wh what they were finding is that organizations that were performing high just kept improving, improving, improving year after year. So at that point, they had to start, they had to create a new category for elite. Um, so as these organizations who are kind of putting time into their CICD process and are starting to become high-performing teams, uh, they keep improving. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so it, it's just a very good reminder that uh, CICD is like not just a one and done task, like it's something you continually have to work on as your team and organization changes. So let's look at some graphs here. So this is just the raw number of changes that were formed for our flagship app, access.com slash management. Um, so this is changes per month, and you can see a pretty big trend up. Here. So back in 2013, even through 2016, we were doing one, maybe two releases a month. So not very often. You can see we started like ramping up in 2017, um, but there were a few kind of points in time I want to call out here. So in February 2018 is when we first implemented um, standard changes with our change management board. So this is where we no longer had to seek approval and all of our changes were just auto-approved now that we had like a documented process. Uh, so May 2018 is where you see a pretty big decline here. That's because we started shifting most of our developer time towards that uh, brand new API project I mentioned earlier. Um, so even though we had the capability to deliver fast, uh, we just didn't have developers writing up code to keep up with our pipeline. And then in August is when we did our first migration of our app to this OpenShift platform. So you can see before that point in time, like our peak was maybe five, five changes in a month. And past that, like we're now, I mean, we've peaked at eight. And I think if we got updated charts, um, we had almost 14 um, in May, or April, sorry. It's just May now. 
Um, and one other thing here to, so we see this one big dip here, uh, that's December. So Red Hat has like a company shut down um, for basically two weeks between Christmas and New Year's. And we also have a lot of folks on PTO. So again, like it's just a point where even though we have like a great CICD pipeline, we just don't have developers working on stories as much. So let's look at some Kanban metrics here too now. Um, so our, our agile coach on our team does a really good job about just kind of keeping these metrics updated over time. Um, and I thought it painted a really good picture of our story here. So a few things to note here. So this blue line at the top is basically the time it takes to, from a story being defined and ready to be developed to being fully released in production. And the red line below it is a time from when a story is defined to when it's ready for release. So that means developer has finished a story and our quality engineers have written their tests and updated it and it's ready to just flow for our pipeline. So basically this area, the distance between the red line and the blue line is how long it takes to basically get packaged into release and flow through the pipeline. So you can see on the left, so like where we were constantly basically getting stories ready and then building up these big like every two week releases. So you'll see a trend up and then back down, trend up and back down. Um, and so like the, the trend line there kind of like evens out a little bit, but if you look at the, um, like the narrower line, it, you very clearly see where it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's basically just when we perform a release and it gets accepted in prod. Um, so a few things to note here on this graph. So December 2017 was when we had a basically change freeze for most of December. Um, so obviously work for Red Hat, we're a big part of the product pipeline. And basically there's an embargoed CVE that was being worked on um, that we now know as Meltdown Inspector. And so you can see there where we started building up changes and we couldn't release until January 1st. Uh, so February 2018 is when we implemented the standard changes, kind of like I showed on the last graph. Um, July 2018 was our first production push for our API project. Um, so another kind of partner, um, enterprise processes that slow us down sometimes is um, architecture review. So because we were deploying a new app, we had to go through a huge long architecture review and we had to work through a few like exceptions that were called out. So what you're seeing here is we're building up all these stories that are kind of basically parked in stage until we got that approval. So that very sharp line, like right at the end of July was when we did our first release of the API to production. And shortly after that is when we did our first, it was basically when we migrated RHSM web to um, OpenShift. So you can see before where we were basically batching up releases and then releasing them at once. Um, so if you look at the area of the chart right after that um, last vertical line, you'll see that the area between that red and blue line is a lot smoother and a lot smaller. So we're releasing almost one story at a time. Now that we've kind of overcome the just administrative overhead of what it takes to release, like we're able to just release one thing at a time and just get that value to the business quicker. So the human factor. So while it's nice to have like these metrics that show like how much we're releasing and um, just give us hard numbers, uh, the human factor is important as well. So how does it feel to deliver software? Like how do you, like how does it affect you? How, does it, how do you feel when you try to get something to prod? So a quote from one of our developers. So our release process used to feel more like filing taxes, but now it's more like sending money with Venmo. Um, I guess for those of you non, those of you non US citizens, taxes probably aren't as big a deal, but here in the US, it's pretty bad. So it was a pretty high praise. And then this is a quote from our product owner. So he says, my favorite part of our CICD adoption has been the freedom to experiment. So having disposable merge instances for giving early feedback, uh, feature flags that let us try things with a targeted audience, um, and even just the experimentation that comes with every member of our team feeling empowered to try things and automating some piece of our process. 
and you also have the He-Man factor. So another quote from our product owner um, says, I'm basically He-Man. By the power of CICD, I have the power to push changes to production myself when an appropriate threshold of quality and organizational preparedness, much of which is built into our pipelines is met. So like our product owner went from being the person we just kind of salted at the very end to being the one who actually be the one to hit the button to go to prod when the business is ready. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we, by removing kind of some of the barriers it takes to um, have people involved in the process, like we have people who aren't necessarily technical, like our product owner, uh, able to control our production pushes. So now you've kind of seen like how our team made this journey from just maybe two releases a month to, I mean, up to consistently eight and even like 14 like we talked about in April. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been a big transformation for us and we've come a long way and we're excited to see where, we're, uh, where we'll be next year even. Um, so any questions? Cool. Um, well, anyway, thank you guys so much for coming out. I realize this is the last session, so you're probably just ready to get some food and go home. Um, but thank you again. Um, I'll be around after this if you have any questions or um, just want to talk CICD. But thanks again. Um, you can feel free to email me. Uh, I'm peteasters at redhat.com. And I very occasionally tweet at Patrick Easters. So feel free to reach out to me. Thank you guys.